Chapter 15. Whispers in the Darkness. Psst! Pinkie Pie, are you asleep yet? Rest. Sleep came in fits and starts. I seriously, desperately needed rest. But every time I closed my eyes, fevered dreams of wasteland horrors dashed themselves against my mind's eye. I saw ponies loading into a passenger Sky Bandit stages wagon. In my mind, they were families on their way to the day of laughter and fun at the Ministry of Morale amusement park. Parents smiling warmly as their colts and fillies pranced in place with anticipation. I don't know why, but I was certain the MOM had built amusement parks, that they had been regularly packed full of screaming kids. I saw mothers urging their colts not to climb on the seats, fathers checking to make sure their cameras had film, and a great wall of green flame with a sinister rainbow sheen rushing towards them that somehow no pony could see. I saw a pony named Trixie leaving a message on the door of her cottage, grinning as she assured herself that her whole life was about to change. I saw her walking away from that door, which in the dream I had somehow become. Even as I called out to her to come back, knowing that if she left, she would never live to see her little cottage again, I called, pleaded, cried. But she could not hear me and walked away. I saw ponies giving their loved ones the great news that they had been selected for a stable. I watched as they, bright and colorful and living ponies, trotted into their new home. The clock on the wall above them, counting down the minutes until an accident would doom them all to horror and death. I awoke with a fit. I was laying somewhere, a bed, but every time I tried to remember exactly where it was, or how I got there, the memory slipped away. I opened my eyes. The room was dark, but light poured in through a cracked open door. I didn't recognize the walls with their shadowed posters, or the roof with its still and silent turret. My body felt wrong. I ached. I felt horribly weak, and I had chills when I wasn't sweating profusely. My stomach churned, and my mouth tasted strange and must mushy. Shadows trotted near the door. I heard Calamity's voice. You think she went and picked up something at the stable? Bell Remedy's voice, soft and clear, responded. Or it could be brought on by stress. I'm worried about her. I think the wasteland is getting to her. Y'all seem to be doing well, Calamity observed, his voice low as not to wake me. Velvet gave a weary, yet very feminine laugh. Not as well as you think, my noble outsider. Was that sarcasm? or affection. I couldn't tell. And trying to think about it made my thoughts swim. And I should do better than little Pip. I'm over a decade more mature than she is. Great. I'm a child to her. Beautiful. I'm a fucking filly. The same filly as the first time we met at some older poly other older filly's cutie sinera. My life couldn't get any better. And all those drugs she's been taking, they're certainly not helping. My stomach convulsed violently. I wanted to cry. My eyelids were too heavy to look around anywhere else. And I didn't fight them as they closed on their own. I turned away from the slice of light coming through the door, falling again in the fitful sleep. Are you going to stay in there, in here with her all night? Clementy's voice was a whisper, very close to my bed. I wasn't entirely sure that I was awake, much less at a point the tides of dreaming had deposited on me on the shore of awareness. I vaguely recalled a change in the darkness, a fluctuation of light, perhaps the opening of a door. At least until her fever breaks, the whisper from Velvet Remedy's voice sounded from near my head. My ears twitched. She's awake? 
She's been in and out. She'll sleep better once the fever's broken. Wonderful. My body felt alien to me. My mind was a horrible, shifting haze. I said a silent prayer to Celestia, begging for her to take my sickness from me and cast it to the moon. I'm more worried about you, Calamity said, and not just because you need to sleep, too. Celestia, do you hate me? My sickness and misery was giving them time to bond. My mind started tormenting me with images of how they might be spending their time together now that I was effectively out of the picture. Oh? My fevered brain insisted that she sounded pleased, as well as oddly condescending. Your shield spell ain't anywhere near as strong as them. Calamity posited. Alicorns. I guess we're calling them now. Was that disgust in Calamity's voice? No, not disgust. Something else. Something unpleasant. As if the word didn't taste good. Your point? If I'm gonna make a habit of using your body to shield other ponies, you need to start wearing armor, Calamity insisted. Yay, Calamity. I was going to tell her that too. Just never quite had the chance. My head was feeling heavy. Just listening seemed to take effort. My body was too hot. The blanket drenched in sweat. But my limbs were too heavy to move. Sleep was creeping on, up on me like the manticore ready to pounce. Wanting to drag me off into nightmares again. Won't give me anything worn by one of those nasty raiders, Velvet said again. I realized I'd missed part of the conversation. Wouldn't want you to. Slaver armor neither. Bad idea. As little Pip, when she's up and about, Clemity whispered firmly. But when we get to Ten Pony, we're gonna buy you some proper duds for the equestrian wasteland. My despondency evaporated at those words. A strange sense of relief, twisted by illness, washed over me. Part of me realized that I had been afraid that they would leave me. I felt doomed to wander until either I found my place in this hellish outside, or... or I fixed it. At least, as much as I could. I suppose I was searching for my virtue, as Watcher had suggested. Like a filly trying to invoke her cutie mark. But Calamity and Velvet were not burdened by my quest, or my sense of being utterly lost. Why wouldn't they leave me to it on my own? once they had found a place to stay. Ten Pony Tower, for instance. Why shouldn't they? To hear them speaking of getting Velvet Remedy armor, something I find firmly agreed with Calamity on, that she needed, even though I couldn't picture my elegant idol wearing anything other than classy dresses. To know that they were planning for a future wandering in the Equestrian Wasteland, presumably with me, filled my heart with assurance and hope. But despite the warmth of these feelings, I drifted back into sleep. My mind began to venture again down dark paths. I found myself wondering what, if anything, could be done to save all the ponies of Stable 29. With exposure to the surface, fatality and their water talisman dying, all I could see was hundreds of ponies trapped in a sarcophagus under the ground, already buried, waiting to die. They did not, my mind insisted, need to die with such violence and horror. But the only way I could think to save even one of them, no, that would have been too adherent to consider. The only way to save even one would have been to make sure the strain in the water talisman was so minimal that its deterioration would have taken several decades. Something that could only have been done if, instead of initially reducing the population by that minimum 0.02%, I cringed away from myself, revolted that I could even think of such a thing. I awoke again, hours later, with a silent gasp, drenched and cold that sank into my soul.
My sense of what I had been dreaming of collapsed into a dark pit that was swiftly sealed by wakefulness. Only a few shreds of that memory remained, and I was fairly certain it had something to do with the Ponyville Library, dead cats, and being burned alive by a dragon. I found a canteen that had been hung by the side of the bed. I drank greedily from it, and then fell back into the horrors of sleep. No! Don't go! I'm trapped! I cried out, my hind legs crushed under a fallen wall. But Velvet Remedy and Calamity just walked away. Please! Don't leave me here! Velvet Remedy leaned her head against Calamity's mane and nuzzled. The ground was stretching between us. They were barely walking, but they were getting further away. The clouds were boiling down, becoming fog, surrounding and obscuring them as my heart threatened to seize. I knew that when they disappeared, I would die. I woke crying, a beat and beat a hoof against my pillow. Despair tainted my hope like a cupcake with ashes mixed under the batter. They were staying with me, but I was losing them to each other. My ears perked. There was no voices. Oh, Luna. I was alone. They'd left me. I still felt trapped. My head jerked up, looking around frantically. Gray daylight seeping between the heavy curtains. Were they armored mesh? raised the ambient illumination in the room. Something heavily pressed against my sides. Turning, I found Velvet Remedy asleep, her head having fallen onto the bed beside me, pinning me under the blankets. Relief was like a flood of painkiller, numbing the irrational fears of my night terror, which clung to me like leeches. I was happy for Velvet and Calamity, no, I really was. I was just... lonely. Lonely and... frustrated. I looked away from Velvet and found myself staring at a huge wall poster, garnishly pink, advertising the Philadelphia Fun Farm Amusement Park. Everything the Grand Galloping Gala should have been endorses Pinkie Pie Every day, forever. Well, now I knew where that notion had come from. On the opposite wall was another copy of the recruitment poster. You too can be a steel ranger. I realized where I must be. Lifting my pip up, I checked the auto map. Steel Hooves Shack. I collapsed back onto the bed, feeling unbearably exhausted, physically and mentally. And even worse, I felt horny, which was not a sensation that mixed well with illness. Maybe it was having Velvet Remedy so close, her head pressing against my flanks as she slept partially on my bed. My stomach twisted in warning. I didn't care. I was too hot, too sick. But still, as I laid back, I tried to summon up my daydreams that would relieve at least one of my symptoms. My hooves beneath the blankets. I turned my face away from velvet, remedy, and shame. I contemplated Candy, but her face and features were already faded in my mind, and the ending of my relationship with New Appaloosa would sour any fantasy. I considered the rainbow-maned mare from the memory orb, but no matter how well she had aged, she was still older than I wanted to fantasize about. And even if I pictured her younger, the link between her and Calamity would just make it weird. Finally, I settled on dreaming about the mare from one of my statuettes, the breathtaking, alluring white unicorn with her dreamy purple mane and tail. I enjoyed that as much as my sickness addled body would allow, for maybe half an hour. Then, like a splash of cold water, 
I realized the mare I was fantasizing about was Velvet Remedy's great, great, something or other, grand aunt. That murdered my fantasy, and danced cruelly on his corpse. The weight of Velvet Remedy's head was suddenly more present than before, and I could feel the warmth radiating from her, and my stomach knotted with guilt. Suddenly, I felt a heavy, a heaving inside me, and the taste of bile. Pushing to the edge of the bed, I vomited into the crevice between the bed and the wall. Still retching, my mouth foul and burning, my eyes shedding tears, I heard Velvet Remedy stir awake. My fall was complete. Now, instead of being a child in her eyes, I'd be a vomit pony. I had no chance of stealing her away from Calamity now. Not that I ever did. Or even would. I'm not that kind of jealous, selfish pony. But, just saying. If I was that kind of pony, this would be the final nail in the coffin of any chance I had. I felt Velvet's weight lift from the bed as she pulled back from me. Oh, little Pip, are you okay? What a stupid question. Yet I nodded, my head pressed against the wall. Let me get you some water. I waited for her to grow, crying just a little against the wall. My coat matted with sweat, my head burning against the wall. Goddess, I'm pathetic. Velvet Remedy returned to give me water, to clean up the wall and floor of my vomit, to bathe me and replace my sheets on my bed. I was in no state to enjoy any of it, but I could properly marvel that she took the time on some pony like me. My fever finally broke sometime that evening, and I finally slipped into a restorative, dreamless sleep. I awoke feeling like I hadn't felt in days. Sane. My body, body was weak, but not feeble, and I was warm and thankfully rested. My mouth tasted pasty, and my stomach had settled, and I found I was quite thirsty. I rolled over in bed, wondering how long I had been half delirious, and spotted Velvet Remedy curled up on the floor fast asleep. My heart went out to her, recognizing how much I owed the older unicorn. Her head rested on an old jacket, and some pony had pulled a blanket over her while she slept. I was sure it was Calamity, and I was pleased. As I floated the canteen from the bedpost, the deep, resonating voice of steel hooves carried in from the other room. Sorry, but I just don't buy it. I don't get you, I heard Calamity respond. There was something in the tone of both ponies' voices that caught my attention. My ears perked, and I drank quietly while I listened. Your group is like a bad beginning of a bad joke. Seal who's elaborated. A covert agent, a princess, descended from pre-war aristocracy, aristocracy, and an outcast from an advanced civilization trod into a saloon to sell, try and sell ponies that they're completely normal. I nearly choked. Swiftly, and without a sound, I plugged the canteen and rehung it on the bed. You think we're lying? Thank you, Calamity, for sounding offended. I think either you're lying to me, or you're lying to you. I heard a stomp, and I assumed it was from Calamity. What makes you think... Because I was conscious, if barely, I saw all of us down for the count. That Alicorn was at full strength, impaired, her magical shield shrugged off grenades. Then, a moment later, she was dead. The voice was low, with a grave accountation for our meeting battle, like a schoolteacher reading test scores. A single bullet hole, right through the brain. You want me to believe some innocent young mare, just weeks out of a stable, did that? Do you? Even believe it? I don't like how quiet Calamity was before saying, Yeah, I do. Because that's what happened. 
An innocent young mare, Steel Hooves repeated, just out of a stable. With her fine criminal skills, they let her pick every lock and hack every computer, even when no pony yells in 200 years had managed that feat. I frowned. I had to admit, I'd wondered about the lack of other skilled lock pickers other than myself. But then, I also knew that I had honed my skills in precise telekinetic lock picking over the years as part of my attempt to conjure my cutie mark. My CAT proved that my natural talents were focused mainly towards mundane and arcane sciences, and my studies as a pit lock technician and the tools of my trade gave me an education to manipulate terminals that few outsiders would have. But most of all, I knew that I hadn't been anywhere near as good at other things, though it went out the stable too, that I had become sense. I had been reading books and getting a lot of practice. Steel Hooves continued. For that matter, a stable that's still in closed operation, it's hard enough to find a stable whose population survived. A dark cloud threatened my mind with that. Calamity's voice was low, and perhaps a little dangerous. Are you suggesting they ain't from a stable? No, I'm sure they're from a stable. The voice was cool and even. I just find it more believable that they were highly trained agents on a mission. Perhaps from some place akin to the Ministry of Awesome Black Ops facility. Then wide-eyed tourists from a repository for civilian ponies. What? I thought Calamity said the Ministry of Awesome didn't actually do anything. Calamity nickered. That's ridiculous. Really? Steelhoof asked. She survived a train jumping off a cliff. I caught her. Seal Hoops paused and seemed to concede that one. How did you meet her? My friend hesitated. Then with a sad breath, I nearly killed her. She'd just come out of Ponyville, where she'd cleared the nest of raiders, Calamity explained. She was covered in blood and wearing armor she'd scavenged from him. So I mistook her for a raider herself swooped out of the sky, and started shooting. I could hear the regret in his voice. I felt a pang in my heart for him, but I also winced at his description. Even Calamity seemed to do a double take at how that sounded, because after the pause, he quickly followed with, They were raiders, mind you. Raiders ain't that hard to kill. Then, seeming to remember the wagon crash, he amended, if you're at least a little lucky, and the terrain is on your side. I see. Steel Hooves deadpanned. So, she's not a secret agent death pony. She's just lucky. How about the other one? Velvet Remedy? She's... Calamity chuckled. She's a civilian. She's a medic and a singer. How does that fit into your covert ops stable theory? Any other talents? Does being the most beautiful pony I've ever met count? I could hear the smile in Calamity's voice. Other than that, no. I mean, well, she does have a freakish knack for getting what she wants. Bartering, I mean. And talking to folks and stuff like that. When she's not being... Calamity, shut up. Good luck, Calamity. Don't finish that sentence. A direct ascendant of one of the three founders of Stable Tech. The founder who, I believe, was Stable Tech's face of public relations, and also the sister of one of the eight most powerful figures in a post-apocalyptic government. A descendant with skills in seduction, trade, and diplomacy. Steelhoofs intoned wearily. No, you're right. That does sound like a civilian pony. I groaned inside. How the hell did Steel Hooves manage to do that? I was beginning to doubt my story, and I'd lived it! I heard Calamity sigh. I hoped it was out of exasperation. Okay, let's pretend just for a minute that my companions and I have been lying through our teeth. Oh no, Calamity, please don't. We've been honest. I know it sounds bad when he says it like that, but... Calamity finished. To what end? Well, 
the deep masculine voice rumbled. They marched into the center of a battle between raiders and slavers. Somehow, got the heads of two factions to sit down in the shot of one's crosshairs, and then proceeded not only to eliminate the other one they did not like, but to kill a dragon running the show, assuming the one that they wanted was in charge. Calamity interrupted. I dare say I had a mite to do with that myself. Steel Hooves continued, undissuaded. To me, that sounds a lot like a special unit rearranging local power structures to suit their purposes. Whatever those purposes might be. Goddesses, damn it. Is this what ponies were thinking? And I had been changing my reputation that I was supposed to be a hero. This was insane. At least Calamity seemed to agree with me on that. Right. Okay then, how about this? If Little Pip was some sort of special black ops pony, how in tarnation could I nearly have killed her? Because underground training facilities aren't exactly the best place to learn to fight aerial opponents. I doubt you'd be able to get the drop on her again. Calamity was fighting down not to fall for it too. Bless him. Look, I've been with them. Y'all haven't. I know they're surprising, but if you got to know them, I'd see that they're not spies at all. Silu's deep voice seemed on the verge of a chuckle. Yep. Thank you, Calamity. Not a sly, sneaky hair in their manes, then. Not a one. Did you know that when little Pip sleeps, she has cute little snores? I do not sn- Oh, crap. Come again? I was just finishing dressing myself. I was levitating my saddlebags into place when the pony in magically empowered armor had stepped in and made this announcement. I will be accompanying you to Ten Pony Tower. After risking your lives to save mine, escorting you to safety and your destination is the least I can do. I wasn't sure how I felt about that. Steel Hooves, however, put his hooves down. I insist. I frowned, looking about the room while I thought. The shack had three rooms. The bedroom, the main room, and a workroom in the back. Upon seeing the whole of it, I realized that Steel Hooves had given me his own bed to sleep upon, and that every pony had slept on the floors save for me. They made me feel grateful and guilty. This was not the bedroom I had spent the last several days sick in, but the main room of the shack, featuring a dining, ta dining table, rows of metal lockers, a desk with a glowing terminal, and a few scattered trophies as decoration. Above the desk was a banner, a half apple with an inlay of three magical sparks ringed by gears, held by a crescent-shaped wing and overlaid by a sword of war with a mouth brace hilt. It was the same emblem that adorned the flanks of the Steel Hooves battle armor, right where his cutie mark would be hidden beneath. The Steel Rangers. I sighed. You'll have to ask the others, I said, clenching my saddlebags tight. I started to strap on the holsters and slings for my weapons. I already spoke with them on this, and they claimed you're their leader. What? Why? I was really the least qualified to be in charge. Because the radio kept saying so? I added that to the list of things to talk to DJ Poem 3 about when we arrived to Ten Pony Tower. I looked over to Velvet Remedy, but she was lying on the floor, her mind lost in the Fluttershy memory orb. In the back room, I could hear Calamity working on the weapons he had procured from Stable 29's armory. Our pockets were now filled with common, low-caliber ammo that fit none of the weapons we had preferred to use. And Calamity was swapping parts and doing repairs on some small pistols and lower power rifles meant to use those bullets. Now that we expected to use them, only the armory supply of shotgun shells was likely to be of service to us. But both weapons and ammo 
would be valuable trading goods. A radio in the back room played DJ Pump 3's radio station. The sounds of a quintet or of ponies gave way to a melody of sorrow, fear, and hope, and the vocals of a pleasant sounding buck who was 200 years dead. I want to calm the storm, but the war is in your eyes. How can I shield you from the horror and the lies? When all that once held meaning is shattered, ruined, bleeding, and the whispers in the darkness tell me we won't survive. Strap my sniper rifle into place. I looked to steel hooves. But my answer faded when I saw he was looking away, his gaze focused on a small picture in the corner of the room that I hadn't noticed before. The picture was of an elder orange mare, her yellow mane salted with gray under her cowboy hat. He swayed slightly, and I felt the gravity in the room that told me not to speak. I did move forward for a closer look, for I already knew I had seen this mare before, many times. Her statuette was in my saddlebags, as was the memory of her that had once been Pinkie Pie's last party. I was certain now that the memory of Steel Hooves was in that orb too. Beneath the picture was a display safe. Inside, perfectly preserved, was yet another statuette of the bucking orange pony. Be strong in the glory of her youth. On top of the case was a small, silk-lined box, much like the one that I had found Vinyl Scratch's safe, within which sat a single memory orb. Steel Hooves only stirred again when the song ended, the last refrain echoing into nothingness. You knew her, didn't you? I asked softly, gently. Steel Hooves turned toward me. How could I have? She died two centuries ago. I gazed at him, not judging, just knowing. He stood rigid against the gaze for several minutes, until I finally looked away. DJ Pone 3's voice erupted from the back room. Got your ears up, faithful listeners? Because I've been talking, and some of you ain't been listening. For years now, I've been reminding you that ghouls and zombies ain't the same thing. Ghouls are ponies who have been the misfortune of soaking up a major dose of radiation and not dying. That stuff twists and rots their bodies, but unlike zombies, their minds are still like those of any other pony, and they deserve to be treated as such. Well, some of you ponies up in Tenpenny Tower didn't get the message, and when Sheriff Rottentail keeps pressing for him and his ghouls to be allowed inside, just because they were sick of being hounded by manticores and slaughtered by bloodwings. Chief Grimstar, the head of Tenpenny Security, responded by hiring a bunch of mercenaries to scour the tenements along Celestial Lane and wipe them all out. In an interview, when asked how he had managed to become such a supreme douchebag, Chief Grimstar had this to say. Another gruff and irate voice came through the radio speakers. Fuck off. I did what was right by those I swore to protect. DJ Pone 3's voice returned. Just warms the heart to know that there are ponies steadfastly defending the prejudice and bigotry. Doesn't it? Thank you, Chief Grimstar. And may Celestia bless you with a kiss from the sun. The last certainly sounded like it was said through gritted teeth. I shook my head. On the one hoof, I actually felt relief to hear that a news report wasn't about me. But on the other, I had experience with ghoul ponies before, like Ditsy Doo, and some actual zombie ponies. I knew the difference, and the idea of some pony endorsing wholesale slaughter of innocent ghouls because they couldn't be bothered to discern between them made me hurt and twinged my vision with red. A deep, masculine voice of steel hooves nickered from within his metal helmet. Not a fan of ghoul supporters, I take it. I looked at him, in confusion that bordered on several darker emotions. 
My disgust had clearly been evident in either my face or body language. It hadn't occurred to me that my reaction could be so easily misread and directed towards DJ Pwn3 himself. One of the wisest, kindest ponies I've met in this blasted hellscape is a ghoul pony. I spat at him. Her name is Ditsy Doo, and she's easily worth any three Steel Rangers put together. Not for fighting skill or fancy weapons, but for the quality of her character. I stomped a forehoof hard enough to sprain it. DJ Pwn3 is right, and if you don't get that, then you have no place traveling with us. Steelhoof said nothing, but began to pack. I gazed at the leftover parts strewn across the workbench in Calamity's wake. Now that I had all the parts to build my poison dart gun, I should use this opportunity to put it together. Invoking my single magical ability, I started to clear away the space while simultaneously pulling the schematics out of my saddlebags. Morning, little Pip. Calamity trotted into the room. Good to see you're back on your hooves. I smiled a little thinly, giving him a nod. The conversation from the night before still casted shadows on my mind. I knew that Calamity and the Steel Ranger had talked about, and just how convincingly Steel Hooves had woven doubts. Calamity knew I'd been eavesdropping, but neither of us had said anything. Looks like we got ourselves a new traveling companion. At least, for a little while, Calamity said conversationally. What'd you think of him? I shrugged. I still wasn't sure what to make of the Steel Ranger. I'd seen the shadows of both good and bad in him. But it was too soon to do anything more than to hop, skip, and jump to conclusions. From Calamity's cautious tone, I could tell he was having doubts about Steel Hooves. I'll admit... We can use the firepower, he offered graciously. Be damned useful having an explosive ordnance specialist like that in the saddle if you run into more of them, uh, alicorns. I nodded. Having begun to worry about the next time we encounter those creatures, if my suspicions were right. On the other hoof, Calamity started to say, then stopped, as if questioning whether his opinion was worth voicing. I turned to look at him. I lifted a hoof in a wave for him to go on. Well, let's just say the Steel Rangers ain't exactly got a reputation as champions of the common pony. Ah, yes. Reputations. The knight's conversation loomed in my mind again. My eyes looked over Calamity, taking in the distance between us. I wondered if the gap was more than just physical. My memories pulled back the sheet on an almost forgotten dream of being trapped under a wall and watching my friends walk away. Hey, little Pip, are you okay? Clearly, I bore my worries like a cutie mark. I snorted at the dusk humor of it. Some secrets spy I'd be. Calamity clopped up next to me and put a hoof gently on my back. Now, don't you worry. Nothing said by that lot is gonna sow seeds of distrust between us. I looked up at him, wide-eyed. He smiled at me. I've seen your heart, little Pip. Y'all genuinely want to help folk, and you put your own life at risk to do so, even when some of them don't even deserve it. I ain't gonna start questioning what I know about you, because some pony who I don't know and doesn't know what he's yipping about can get it all twisted up. I could feel tears gathering in my eyes. I tossed my forelegs around the big, rust-colored pony and hugged him for all I was worth. You can look into it if you want. It was the first thing Steelhoofs had said to me since my outburst over an hour ago. Bowman Remedy was in the room, looking over the provisions. Clementy was refilling our canteens from Steelhoofs' water purifier. I had finished my packing and had been staring aimlessly. A curious gaze had eventually fallen on the memory orb, sitting enthroned under the picture of Applejack, mayor of the Ministry of... I realized I didn't know which Ministry of Luna's government Applejack had been in charge of. I just had enough clues to make a few educated guesses. 
Go ahead. Seal who's encouraged. It hasn't been viewed in a long, long time. Some pointing else should remember. I regarded first the Steel Ranger, then the Orb. I had to wonder why any pony other than a unicorn would be keeping one, since only unicorns had access to the memory orbs stored within. It made no sense, I realized, unless that pony was keeping it so that it could be shared, or safekeeping it, but if safekeeping it was just the same as throwing it away if no pony ever witnessed it, what was kept inside. I nodded, respectful of what I was being offered. I leaned forward, pointing my horn towards the sphere and touching it with my magic. My world fell away. I was harnessed to something. We were standing off stage, concealed in darkness by a heavy curtain. Applejack stood next to me, staring out at the dark stone stage the podium and microphone and speakers. The mumbling throng filled the auditorium in front of it, and a huge brass MWT logo on the wall behind it. I, or at least the pony whose memory I was writing, only had eyes for her. She looked nervous, not to mention uncomfortable, in her formal business dress. I can't do this. I felt myself speak, heard the words coming from my voice. You'll be fine. The voice was deep and strong, like steel hooves, but not nearly so gravelly. They hate me. Half of them already have been saddled for because I started pulling all my hooves with the ministry instead of just letting them do what they wanted. Am I bringing in Twilight's ponies? From her tone, that had apparently not gone over too well at all. I wrapped a foreleg around her neck, allowing me to glimpse the apple-green color of my coat. It nuzzled her gently, a sensation that I found quite pleasant. And after today, they'll all understand it, and will admire you for it. I, or more precisely the pony I was riding, leaned close and whispered into her ear, Now go on out there and make history or I'll be forced to spank you. Oh, goddess Celestia. The orange pony blushed and gave her encourager a look that I thought would have paid almost anything to have the mare give me. Later, lover boy. She smiled, at least more cheerful now, and strode out before the crowd. The pony I was riding watched her stride, his eyes straying repeatedly to her flanks, though my gaze with his. As much as I couldn't blame him, it was making me feel distinctly uncomfortable. This was an odd memory to be sharing. Then I nodded. I, I noticed that she had a holster strapped to one leg, almost hidden beneath her formal attire. The ivory handle flashed three red apples as she walked. The reception was not the respectful and admiring silence which Fluttershy received, but Applejack stood up straight at the podium, cleared her throat, and spoke slowly and clearly. Now listen up. I know y'all been a bit sore about having ponies from the Ministry of Arcane Sciences working with us. I know y'all are dedicated to improving Equestria, the Earth Pony way, and magic kind of flies in the face of all that. But there are some things that are just too important to let stubborn pride get in the way of asking for help. Trust me. I know. And I want y'all to know how proud I am to be standing here today, able to finally show you all the fruits of your efforts. Most of you want to know what you've been working on. It was important to keep things... The next word did not seem to come naturally to her compartmentalized to keep this project out of zebra hooves which all have accomplished in just one year ain't been a bunch of earth ponies doing more good work in less time than when we built Appaloosa until this point her words were undercut by resentful rumbles 
of whispers, opinion. Now, her voice dropped into a tone, both somber and deadly serious. The ponies in the audience began to hush. Not for her, but out of reverence of what she spoke of. When I was young, my big brother, Big Macintosh, was always there for me. He was my closest kin, and he never really let me down. And when Equestria needed him, he didn't let us down neither. He served heroically in our army, fighting for our way of life for three years. And then, when we needed him most, he made the ultimate sacrifice. When that zebra bullet punched through my brother's armor and pierced his heart, it broke my heart too. I could see Applejack's eyes start to tear. Her voice trembled, but she pressed on. The room was now dead silent, except for her. One year ago, we buried my brother, Big Macintosh. And that day, I swore an oath that no other pony would die needlessly in battle. They're risking their lives out there for us. We owe them better. And now, starting today, we give them better. My memory escort started walking onto the stage. I felt the ropes trailing from me, left, and pulled taut, the harness digging into my flesh. I felt the resistance and heard the wheels of the wagon I was pulling begin to move. Ponies of the Ministry of Technology, I give you to the Secret Ranger, the Steel Ranger. Moments later, the memory collapsed. The last slight lingering in my mind as my own world reasserted itself. I glanced back at the display wagon and the magical power armor it was carrying. I looked at Steel Hooves, sensing how I understood him far more than I had moments ago. The light gray of the clouds had descended shrouding the landscape in fog. Around all of us, the rubble of blasted, flattened, and aged, demolished buildings created shadows and obstacles. I regularly had to check my EFS compass to make sure we were still headed in the right direction. Even Calamity was grounded to avoid losing us. We were entering the outskirts of Manhattan now, and I felt a pang of disappointment that I couldn't properly see the city. Lemony and Velvet had taken the lead. My frequent attention to my eye forward sparkle was as much a spot of hostile creatures to navigate. Another red spot flared up in front of us, and just off to the left. Calamity, seven o'clock. Calamity nodded and crouched down, sneaking forward. The fog wrapped around him, concealing him from my vision, but my EFS compass marked his position. Velvet hung back a little, but kept him locked in her sight, her horn glowing faintly as she prepared to throw a shield around the orange maned Pegasus and the black Desperado hat. A moment later, a single twin shot rang out. Calamity returned, a giant rad hog, one of the mutilated, mutated pig-like creatures I'd encountered under the train bridge. I do hope you're not planning to cook and eat that, Velvet Remedy intoned, disparately. I can't imagine all the meat you've been eating be any good over the last few days. I shot her a look that she would probably couldn't see and said nothing. You see now, that's why y'all are vegetarian, Clamity laughed. Why, you ain't never had no bacon. Trust me, if ponies were meant to only eat fruits, oats, and grasses, then the existence of bacon would be the proof of the pie that the world was just cruel and evil. Oh great, now I had to try eating rat hog. A few moments later, we had a cooking fire started, and Calamity was explaining to me just which parts of the rat hog were the most delicious. Velvet Remedy had chosen to join Steel Hooves, and ignoring the two of us. 
Her silky voice sliced through the air as she told Steel Hooves. Now, if we get into a battle, I do hope you have good sense to let Calamity and Little Pip handle it. No offense, I really am thankful for you coming to a rescue, but I came closer to dying from all the explosions than the alicorns. I hadn't thought of it that way, but Velvet Remedy had a strong point. Still, whose weapons are all extremely excessive. And while that was very good for fighting manticores and alicorns at a distance, it could be lethal to every pony in close quarters, or in close spaces. I'd have to convince Steel Hooves to keep himself in reserve until he was needed. I wasn't sure how that would go over with a Steel Ranger. Traveling with others and having to take precautions to keep his own companions alive was not, I suspected, something Steel Hooves had been required to deal with in a long time. Old song, Calamity was saying to Velvet Remedy, as the two of them looked, or took the lead once again. If I sung a little bit of it, it, badly probably, could you magic up some music to go with it? Well, Velvet said uncertainly, I could certainly try. Then, with a reassuring smile, and your voice is quite good. If you took some singing lessons, you'd be very pleasant to listen to. I rolled my eyes. That's my velvet. No, that's Calamity's velvet, I reasserted to myself, and then wiped the whole thought clean. Velvet Remedy was velvet's velvet. It would be, until she said otherwise. And even then, only so long as she allowed it. Calamity was going to be Velvet's Calamity. And I was not going to be a jealous third wing. Steel Hooves were bringing up the rear. I dropped back, choosing to engage him in this discourse rather than dwell in the two ponies in front of me. Trying to strike up a conversation, I told him I had a question with the memory I'd seen. What question? His voice suggested there were a great many questions he suspected I might have, and most of them were not really my business. The Ministry of Technology. Why MWT? When the Unseen Pony spoke, I could hear a touch of relief in his voice. Officially, it was the Ministry of Wartime Technologies, but Applejack hated that name. She was always the first to point out that the technological, technological innovations that MWT championed and subsidized benefited all of Equestria, not just the war effort. I nodded, listening intently. It was a subject that Steel Hooves had some warmth for. But a small flash of green in the sky above us distracted my gaze. I looked up, but saw nothing. I turned to ask Steel Hooves if he'd seen anything but he was continued to speak about Applejack's ministry. I doubted a sky wagon crash would have diverted his attention. Under the ministry's guidance and support, dozens of innovative technology industries blossomed across Equestria, and existing ones became a lot more powerful, their products becoming part of every pony's daily life. Companies like Ironshod, Four Stars, Equestrian Robotics, yeah. And even stable tech. He turned his helmeted gaze towards my pit buck. So, why is the name focused on war? It should have been the Ministry of Technology. I heard music. Not Velvet Remedy or Calamity. Patriotic gala music, whispering out of the mist. I stopped, turning in place until the little blip of light appeared on my compass. Every pony hold up, please. I want to check something. Alone? Steel Hooves questioned. Yes, I nodded. It's okay. I'll be right back. Did she do that a lot? I heard him ask my companions as I slipped off into the mists, following the sound. Do what? Clemity snickered. Wander off? Break travel to explore random ruins? All the time. 
I was approaching a building. Half of it was a huge barn with vast shattered windows. The other half loomed castle-like in the mist. My pit buck flashed a name across my EFS. Four Stars Grand Terminal and Central Offices. The music cut out, and with a static pop. Hello, Watcher. Hello, Little Pip. I see you've made a new friend. Maybe, I said, not committing either way. As if on cue, Steelhoof's deep voice resonated through the mist. Little Pip, you okay? Wow. Stealthy, he was not. Hey, the mechanical voice of Watcher expressed. That voice sounds familiar. That didn't surprise me. Steelhoof's voice was very distinct. And if Watcher had been stooping around the equestrian wasteland for any length of time, it may very well have spied on the Steel Rangers. Watcher. Now there was some pony who deserved to be suspected as a covert spy. I looked around for the sprite bot, but the fog concealed it expertly. Instead, I spotted twin vending machines, Sparkle Cola and Sunrise Fasparilla, and a third set a few yards down from them, Iron Shod Ammo Exporium. The last had been torn open and thoroughly looted. I felt a chill, imagining the kind of pre-war world where you could buy ammo along with your soft drinks at a street-side machine. No pony interacted necessary. Watcher, was there a Ministry of Awesome? That was just a leading question. Clearly, I already knew. Ah yes, Rainbow Dash. The disembodied artificial voice somehow managed to sound amused, even though it had no inflection at all. Yes, one of Equestria's heroes did decide to call her ministry, that her ministry would be called the Ministry of Awesome. They even built a ministry headquarters on it. On Ministry Walk. I assume Calamity mentioned it? I nodded. Then, realizing Watcher couldn't possibly see any better than I could, see through the spite bot, although it would truly surprise me if that was the case, I stated, yes. Ministry Walk. I'd heard of that place before, but I couldn't quite put a hoof on where it was, or when. After pondering it fruitlessly, I finally asked, what did the Ministry of Awesome do? I hated, loathed, questioning something Calamity had told me, especially based on something Steelhoof had said. Even more so after Calamity had not done the same. Not much, Watcher said to my great sense of relief. I mean, Rainbow Dash did throw two or three projects their way. A single pony project was one of theirs for example, but for the most part, they just lounged around and did nothing. After a few years, Luna ordered, up, ordered it crated up, and they began using the MAW HQ for storage. Another question came to me. I activated my pit buck, inventory, arrangement spell, and opened my saddlebags, then stopped, checking to make sure. Can you see me? Yes, little Pip. I can see you. Thought so. I floated up the two statuettes I have found. What are these? Of course, watch knew the answer. Limited edition Ponies of Harmony. Those are some pretty nice little magical artifacts you have there. Only 42 were ever made. 42? I was expecting closer to 6. The question is heroines. The six pony friends whose virtues matched the elements of harmony. There were seven sets, made one for each of them. And that one, and one that Luna kept for herself. The ponies mostly gave them to each other, although a few of the statuettes were passed on to loved ones or family members. That made sense. Sweetie Belle had her sisters. Applejack would have given one to herself and her buck friend, Apple Snacks. I wonder if there was one I found on old Appaloosa had originally been a grift for Bay Brayburn. Oh, now I remember who your new friend sounds like. 
The name Watcher told me made me glad I wasn't drinking Sparkle Cola again. Who was... I never got to finish my question. A crack of static replaced Watcher with the voice of Red Eye, who was in the middle of telling everyone that the raiders, ghouls, and hellhounds were bad. His voice faded as the sprite bot wandered aimlessly away until it was swallowed entirely by the mist. Four Stars was an elevated train company, which had once provided public transportation to the Manhattan metropolis. Stulehoof suggested that, if the monorails were still intact, it would make the easiest route through the city, carrying us over the maze of rubble, and away from most of the radiation-twisted abominations and occasional raiders that lurked in the ruins. It sounded like a good plan. So I stopped at a still illuminated sign, mapping out the rails. This station was part of the Luna Line. The Celestial Line, which crossed it at several points, led straight to Ten Pony Tower. Calamity finished rummaging through the garbage bins. He returned with a surprising collection of sellable items and a few dozen bottle caps. Velvet Remedy rolled her eyes. Well, I hope that's enough for you to buy you a bath once we get to Ten Pony. She looked across the waiting station, towards the heavy doors, onto the more cattle-like office structure. There were back in panels that looked like turrets, which had been destroyed ages ago. Curiously, I trotted over to the door and tried to open it. Locked. Well, that was just begging for me to open it. What are you doing? Steelhooves asked, as he and the others joined me. I want to see what's inside, I said simply, focusing on the lock. This was a hard one. Four stars did not want to give up its secrets easily, which only made me all the more intent on learning what those secrets were. I heard Calamity snicker, and clearly translated too. Told you so. The lock clicked. Triumphantly, I swung open the door. In an eye blink, I registered the expanse of the gray lobby, its semicircular desk fortified with sandbags and makeshift barricades. In that glimpse, I saw the scattered bodies of a dozen steel rangers, suits of magical power armor, holding skeleton pony remains. And I saw the three scorched holes in the ceiling, which had held turrets. The remaining turret of the four stars lobby ceiling swung around an open fire. I was taken by surprise, but felt the remedy had been surprised, or prepared. Her shield burst around me, even as the air was filled with the rat-tat-tat-tat of machine gun fire. However, the shield gave no protection, and the bullets ripped right through it, then through my armor, and through me. My body tore apart in agony, dozens of things going horribly wrong inside, all at once, as at least six shots passed clean through me and buried themselves in the station's floor tiles. I barely heard the explosive roar of Steelhoof's grenade machine gun as I collapsed, sound and light fleeting from me. It was as if the world was falling, and I was falling down a well. Through a distant ring above, I could see the ceiling detonate in a mass of fireballs and then come raining down with a distant thunder, collapsing into the lobby below. I returned to the wasteland of the living, alert and in pain. Velvet Remedy was pouring another extra strength restoration potion down my throat. I choked, gasping. Welcome back, little Pip. We came very close to losing you. Velvet's voice was stern with worry. What happened? Clemity's voice called out from somewhere further into the rubble. Armor-piercing bullets. His voice sounded disbelieving and alarmed. Stop! Ordered Steel Hooves. I panicked, wondering what I was doing that I could stop. But his exclamation was directed towards Calamity. I will not let you loot the bodies of fallen rangers. Hey! Clemity shot back. 
In case you didn't notice, they ain't using this stuff anymore. And the ammo, that ridiculous battle saddle of yours throwing around, ain't cheap. It ain't the sort of stuff you can find in raiders' ammo boxes, or the desk drawers of an office building. We need to scavenge it from wherever we can. Whenever we can. Calamity quieted a moment, and then trotted into view with a missile in his mouth. Trust me, they ain't missing it. He spat out the missile into a pile he was collecting, shooting a glare at steel hooves. I looked to Velvet Remedy, who was prodding me to drink more. Right, from now on, stick into buildings that might not be friendly. The steel hooves made his way back to me. I wondered how covert, super, death pony-like I looked now to him, my armor full of holes and covered in my own sticky blood. I would need to have it cleaned and mended when I got to Ten Pony Tower, or maybe sooner. I was guessing I didn't look much better than I had coming out of Ponyville. You definitely got my attention, he said, and turned towards the nearest Dead Ranger. Right now, I want to know more about this building, too. I nodded. Okay, let's split up. I considered cleeping Velvet Remedy at my side, but realized that it wasn't the best play. Steel Hooves with me. Velvet, would you mind staying with Calamity? You two look into the rest of this floor and the basement. We'll check out the offices upstairs. Velvet smiled, and then fixed me with a harsh stare. Be careful. A lot more of this, and you'll be dead. So be a lot more careful than this was. I promised. Attention all four-star employees. In conjunction with new safety and security protocols, all employees will be issued a standard military-class firearm. This firearm is to be worn at all times while on company property. Failure to do so, or failure to keep your firearm well maintained and properly loaded, will be grounds for termination under Employee Uniform Policy 13B. In the unlikely event of incursion into Four Stars private property by government forces, all employees are required to defend Four Stars property and executive personnel. All employees are therefore required to attend at least one of the three four-star defense and teamwork building weekend training programs this month. Failure to do so will also be the grounds for termination under Employee Attendance Policy 6F. Daisy May will now be providing some of her lovely home-baked flour cookies for refreshments after the FSDTB exercises. Yum! I'd read the same message before. It was on each terminal I'd hacked into. It didn't make any more sense to me now than the first time. I looked over at Steel Hooves, checking to make sure everything was alright before I clicked the next one. I figured now was a good time to ask. Steel Hooves? Have you ever heard of someone named Flutter Guy? Steel Hooves whined. Why do you ask? Oh, I heard some pony say your voice sounded like Flutter Guy. Steel Hooves gave a little stomp. Heard that before. My ears perked. I'd figured it was a long shot, at best, that Steel Hooves would have any knowledge of the pony Watcher had mentioned. I opened my muzzle to ask, but he silenced me. It's just a joke. Oh, so much for insight. I turned back to the terminal messages. Evacuation policy, employee version. We here at Four Stars value your commitment to the company. In an extremely unlikely event of federal raid, or worse, a megaspell attack, it is every employee's duty to bodyguard key personnel and ensure the safe evacuation of all employees in the following order. 1. President of Four Stars and any shareholders on property. 2. 
members of the executive management. 3. Head researchers. 4. The president's secretary, Daisy May. 5. Members of mid-level management. 6. Research assistants with red, black, or gold level clearance. 7. Research assistants with orange or white level clearance. 8. Floor supervisors. Once all of the above have been safely evacuated from the property, we encourage you to seek your own safety. To ensure your protection, we are issuing military class armor piercing ammo to all employees above the supervisor level. I sat back from the terminal. I promised myself that if I was somehow hurled back in time, I would never go to work here. There was a surprising amount of still functional arcano technology in this building. Or at least, there had been. Steel Hooves was not subtle, and every time he took out one of the security brain bots or spider-like guards, he did massive damage to everything nearby. Scavenging had been reduced to finding things inside metal desks, or looting ammo boxes. Fortunately, there were quite a few of each. Nobody had safely broken into this place in centuries, and the sheer number of ammo boxes alone could have supported a small army. Clemente had been right. Not one of the boxes included missiles or grenade ammo. But we had enough of just about everything else, including a lot of armor-piercing rounds, to last a good long time, with extra to sell. The prevalence of armor-piercing ammo had Steel Hoops convinced this place had been fortified specially against the Steel Rangers. There was one more. And this one seemed a private message, not duplicated on any other terminal yet. R.E. Colon. Satin. I hear the Ministry of Morale got her. Charges of sedation. MOM agents broke into her house in the middle of the night last weekend and hauled her away. Management is throwing fits on the floor above me. They seem sure Satin will say something. Or worse. Remember something. All I know is, I'm expecting armored ministry goons to buck in the doors any day now. Fuck these apple seed shooters. I'm going to start bringing my gun from home. Steel hooves turned away. Protecting my flanks as I snuck forward, I split my attention between the hall and my EFS compass as I scouted ahead checking rooms, digging into desks, and looking through bookshelves, until another splash of red lit up my compass. Backtracking, I pointed steel hooves in the direction of the next hostile. Then, I lingered back in the side room, not wanting to get caught in the backwash that accompanied the attack he made in the narrow hallway. A robotic voice called out, This is private property, Federal Pigs. Surrender, and be annihilated. It was immediately followed, by the whoosh of a rocket, and the hallway erupted in flames. To my surprise, I heard steel hooves at the floor. Luna shitting moon rocks. That was from the security robot? What kind of robot fires missiles? I pulled out my sniper rifle, loaded armor-piercing bullets into it, and then, crouching low, I peeked around the corner. The robot took up most of the hall and looked like a mutant child of a steel ranger and a tank. Its four legs ended in treaded balls that repelled it slow down the corridor. I counted at least three weapons, including a missile launcher turret and a minigun set into swivel chest mount that could rotate 180 degrees around the robot's frame. My mind searched for the appropriate level of profane profanity, but came up blank as a newborn's flank. The thing was rolling towards Steel Hooves, who was moving but down. The chest minigun swung towards the fallen ranger, and I was quite certain that it had armor-piercing ammo in its own. Leaping around the corner, I swung the sniper rifle and stared down its scope. That minigun stopped pointing towards Steel Hooves and began to turn towards me as I slid into sats, targeting Nirvana. The sniper rifle roared off three shots in perfect, quick succession. The first two bullets punched small holes in the head of the tank-like Sentinel, seeming only to slightly impair its targeting. The Sentinel's minigun tore up the wall, 
a single bullet tearing into my armor and deeply grazing across my left flank. The third shot struck into the missile turret, which promptly exploded. The rockets had been designed to take out a steel ranger, and they were just as effective in rendering the sentinel inert. My left hind leg felt wobbly. Fresh blood mixed with the matted, sticky mess of my coat. I hobbled over to steel hooves. His armor was administering healing potions and bolstering drugs. The armor soft repair spell had consumed scrap metal from an armored compartment over his left right flank, rebuilding itself. I stopped a moment to marvel at what Applejack and her ministry had created. Will you be okay? I asked. Steelhoof nodded, stalwart, stalwartly, not moaning. Then I'll be right back. I want to know what that monster was guarding. The Sentinel robot had been guarding the office suite of the President of Four Stars. The desk was armored, designed to be used as a barricade. There was a hidden panel under the wall, or in the wall. It would have been hidden if it had been closed. The desk was locked, and picking it cost me a bobby pin, and netted me what looked like a security pass card. I nookered at the irony suspecting the card would have let us pass freely by all the robotic security we had fought through to get here. Several locked boxes of ammo were hidden under the desk. As I opened the first, I found half a dozen matrix disruption grenades. I knew immediately that they were designed to disrupt the spell matrixes of Steel Ranger armor, rendering them helpless, just as the Olicorn attacks had done steel hooves. But I couldn't help thinking how much grenades would also disrupt the more mundane technologies of most robots, including the ones guarding this room. Magical shotgun of dragon slaying in the dragon's chamber, indeed. It took me several tries to hack the computer, and each time backing out before I could recognize the intrusion and lock me out completely. Evacuation Policy Executive version. When Manhattan suffers a mega spell event, or worse, if the Ministry of Morale stages a raid on this property, all executive officers of Four Stars are to proceed to the basement stable in accordance to evacuation procedures, procedures ZS 1A 5D, listed below. Please keep to your assigned routes. The Four Star Stable is guaranteed to keep you safely protected in the event of either catastrophe, and has food, water, and medical supplies to outlast even a complete mega spell event, nearly 12 whole weeks worth. The EFS also includes an armory. F F S F S S <clears throat> firing range to keep in practice and plenty of reading material to keep you occupied. These also include instruction manuals on how to accumulate yourself with the new exterior environment once after effects of magical spell detonations have subsided. The proper etiquette for greeting and ruling the proper etiquette for greeting are ruling zebra benefactors. Okie dokie loki, steel rangers were not ministry morale. Some pony had called in the big guns, and worse, the ponies in charge had been expecting it. What were they doing? According to the attached map, the hidden stairs would lead us right down to the basement, where we should be able to meet up with Calamity and Velvet Remedy swiftly from there. I began to pick the lock on the weapons cabinet, like the terminal, and I pushed the limits of my skill. I was tempted to use one of my party time mentals to give me an extra edge, but just before I gave up, and did so, the cabinet opened. Inside was an armored dress, unlike any I'd seen before. Red and black with gold trim, perfectly preserved. I pulled it out and draped it over my back, thinking Velvet Remedy would look stunning in it. The armor also came with a helmet, but I was tempted to leave it. The flourish of red feathers screamed, Target. 
Also inside were several salt carbines of a particular and impressive design. One of them was scoped and fitted with a silencer. It had a custom wood-carved handle stained with stripes of white and black. Been waiting for you, little Pip. Calamity smiled at me as I joined him in the basement. He and Velvet Remedy stood before a door sealed with a terminal. Looking at the terminal, I was pleased to discover that it had a magic eye for scanning pass cards. Damn thing would be useful after all. I offered Velvet Remedy the outfit I had, but she sunned the helmet as garish but soon had Calamity helping her into the armored dress. I turned my attention to the terminal, floating up the pass card. Where the hell did you find that? Steel Hooves' voice boomed as he finally caught up to us. I turned to look at him as I telekinetically held the pass card in place. Steel Hooves had stopped at the bottom of the stairs and was staring at Velvet Remedy. Little Pip found it in the locker upstairs, Velvet Remedy answered, prancing. How do you think it looks on me? Beautiful, Calamity answered, with a deep breath. The red and gold matches the streaks of your mane and tail. Then, with a sheepish grin, and I've never seen anything like it, which means no pony will mistake you for a raider or slaver and accidentally shoot you. The terminal's magic eye looked over the pass card and beamed happily. Welcome, Mrs. President. The inner mechanism began to hiss and grind as the door began to open. This wasn't anything as sophisticated as a stable tech door, but it was certainly a few grades above anything I'd seen in the wasteland. I might shoot her, Steelhoofs grumbled. We all shot him perplexed and nasty looks. That, he explained, is a zebra legionnaire's uniform. Calamity whistled. Velvet Remedy suddenly looked uncomfortable, and I turned away, instead choosing to look at the darkness of the open mini-stable in front of me. Gleaming in the darkness, the eyes of at least a dozen zombie ponies stared back at me. Then I did a double-take. Zombies, yes, but not ponies. Footnote. Level up. New perk. Action Philly, level 1. You know your targeting spell is like the back of your hoof, making you about 20% cooler in combat. For each level of this perk, you gain plus 15 action points in sats.